Welcome to the Friday edition of Forecast Lab. Just a quiet summer afternoon here in Texas, but elsewhere around the world, social media is buzzing with news of tornado damage in the Czech Republic. A tornado that moved through that area killed at least five people and injured more than 200. The damage is thought to be somewhere around F3 to F4. And here are some drone images showing possibly EF3 damage, though construction standards are different there, and I don't claim to be an engineer. In any case, a tragic situation, and you can head to that Twitter account right there to see more videos. Let's take a very quick look at how that happened. Here we have Austria, the Czech Republic, and Poland. Strong cold front was moving through yesterday on the day of the tornado, 7 a.m. And we can see dew points were up near 70 in parts of Hungary and Slovakia. And further up to the north, 70. And that little blue area, that's where the tornadoes would happen about 11 hours later. Not much change at 9Z or 10 a.m. I did do a quick isodrosotherm analysis right there by hand, and that shows the higher moisture and some of the higher theta E's. At 12Z, 1 p.m., we did have some storms breaking out in central Austria, right along that front, and those were going to move east-northeast right into that better moisture. I also analyzed this little feature here, some sort of convergence line. Looks a little bit like a dry line. There was stronger mixing back behind it and some very warm temperatures. This is how things looked at 15Z, about 4 p.m. Storms breaking out all over northern Austria. And you can see right there, those hard hit areas back behind that cold front where the winds are a little weaker and maybe slightly backed relative to the upper flow. And out in the warm sector, dew points still running in the 60s. And you can see the dew points have dropped off a little bit behind this boundary right here. Lots of cells here are very characteristic of a weekly capped air mass. And by 18Z, about 7 p.m., this is when that area was getting hit. That cell right there, you can see it's running right along that boundary right there. Not very much storm relative inflow looking at the surface chart, but the upper air charts do look a little bit different. I'm going to show that briefly. I'm going to boil this down to the essential charts. This is the 500 millibar chart. The winds were a little bit stronger in the mid-levels compared to the upper levels. And we've got the strong mid-level system moving into Italy. And you can see the jet aligned right like that. The area of concern located right here. This was about 1 a.m. local time as we move through the nighttime and the morning. You can see that strong jet moving towards Austria. And by afternoon, much stronger winds moving into that region. And looking at the height contours, certainly some evidence of a trough right there. So now we're zooming in. Here's Austria. Here's the Czech Republic and the area of concern right in here. Now the surface charts did not really show a whole lot. You can see a low coming together in central Austria moving up towards the Czech Republic. So that would indicate some turning of the winds out of the southeast. But let's go up to 850. So this is about daybreak. We're looking at the approach of that upper level system. We're going to see the storms fire right around here. And you notice as that upper energy approaches, the winds respond right there. We've got some cyclonic flow right there, probably development of a meso low. And it also looks like that low is in the lee side of the Alps. The flow running like that, and we expect the lee side effects to occur right there. 850 millibars, about one kilometer above the surface. Watch this area right here. This is daybreak. And then midday, a little bit of response in central Austria. And then as the afternoon goes on, look at that flow strengthen. By 18Z, the GFS forecasting 20 to 25 knots, kind of a miniature low-level jet feeding right up into southeastern Czechia. 
And if we take a look at some soundings right there, and there's that sounding, that's going to be our proximity sounding. And look at that shear right there on the hodograph. That's some very good shear, the right mover right there. And that sweeps out a very large SRH area, especially from zero through two kilometers. And going back to the morning hours, there's 9Z and there's 6Z. So that SRH really developed through the day. Looks a little bit like a Southern Plains type sounding, some dry air aloft. A little bit of a cap there at 850 and some fairly deep moisture. Looks like 60s dew points throughout maybe the lowest 100 millibars of the sounding. And here we have the best available radar starting at about 13Z, which is going to be about 2 p.m. You can see the storms get going in the south part of the screen in Austria, and then they move up towards the Czech border. Now, unfortunately, this appears to be composite reflectivity. So a lot of the typical hook echoes, that kind of thing, those are going to be completely smeared out. So about all this does is confirm that the area got hit with a bad storm, and it helps a little bit with reconstructing the surface analysis. And here we have the best available visible satellite data. This is from Kauchelman Weather, and you see those storms develop there southwest of Vienna and move up into the Czech Republic. Definitely evidence of a strong upper level wave moving into that region. And towards the end, you can see the overshooting tops, and then it becomes nighttime. Returning our focus once again back into the United States, tropical moisture flowing northward from Texas into Missouri and into the Midwest. You can see those widespread 70s dew points through that region. And then we've got this new push of cold air coming down through the central plains. A little bit of a dry line starting to show up, a little bit of definition in that moisture field with that downslope air coming in from New Mexico. However, we are going to see an increase in moisture in West Texas and into New Mexico over the weekend as that monsoon builds into Arizona. Up in Canada, we do have an assortment of conditions. You can see 80s all the way from northwestern Alberta into the Northwest Territories. And there's 82 right there, just west of Yellowknife. Also very warm on the East Coast. Labrador there getting 81 degrees with 70, a little ways up the coast there. That's certainly warm for that area. And also temperatures much above normal in the western high Arctic right here where they're getting 50s at Banks Island and Victoria Island. That's definitely a little bit above normal. However, that's not really unusual. 77, pretty warm there at Inuvik, and then we can see cold air on the north slope of Alaska. Yep, there it is. 34 at Barter Island. Looks like maybe about 35 at Prudhoe Bay. SPC, yeah, we've got a few storms going. Slight risk in the Central Plains. Looks like convective complex south of Kansas City towards Emporia, located right about there. Another cluster of storms in the Texas Panhandle, and another area of thunderstorms near Elkhart, Kansas. And then just kind of an assortment of weaker stuff in Iowa out towards the Great Lakes and in North Dakota. And can't forget Florida. Very common this time of year, lots of storms going in the north part of the state where we've got sort of a stalled boundary. There's a look at the storms in the Texas Panhandle a few severe thunderstorm warnings, and that's mostly going to be for wind since we have inverted V soundings. Some hail may be a risk, quarter to probably quarter sized hail on some of the stuff, but the freezing levels are quite high. That's compensated somewhat by the dry air in the low and mid levels, which drops the wet bulb temperature through the column. There's some strong storms right there, probably have some hail aloft in that stuff, but you can see that we don't have the characteristic hook echo signature, little concavity right there. But uh, overall, there's the tops up at about 41,000 and 
If we track that all the way down, we don't see any high reflectivities suspended aloft. There's a look at Kansas, kind of a ragtag assortment of multi-cell storms. None of those is particularly favored. A few severe cells here and there. Those are going to be for winds and small hail, kind of the same situation as Texas. And there's the view a little bit further east. Looks a little bit more like popcorn storms up there north of St. Louis. Definitely a dry day through Tennessee, down into Alabama, but we move down to Florida. Yeah, they've got storms going through the area between Jacksonville and Tampa. And that's a look at the Tampa radar, a little bit of uh, stronger activity down in that region. No real severe potential, however, some strong reflectivities indicating some torrential rain and could get some wind gusts out of any of those. Now, we did talk about the upper level patterns earlier this week. Here's how the charts are looking this weekend. 591 decameter high over Victoria Island. This is very unusual. Cutoff high right there, and then we have this cutoff low just to the south. Take those two together, and that gives us somewhat of a Rex block through that region. Anyway, this low in California has been kind of dying off. However, the ridge is setting in across the Pacific Northwest, and that's going to bring some heat to that region. Elsewhere, a few waves moving through this progressive flow through the Great Lakes into Illinois and also helping to trigger some of that stuff in the central U.S. As we move forward, you can see that high really building into Seattle and Vancouver. Quite a strong high there. Meanwhile, this large Medium wave trough moves into the central U.S. The low heights with that, the cool temperatures aloft, that will help keep some storms going here and there through the central U.S., whereas the ridge out east will tend to keep things shut down. That high will be entrenched for Saturday into Sunday, and you see that 597 decameter contour right there. That's actually very rare anywhere. In fact, I've only seen 600 a handful of times, maybe just two or three times actually. We almost never get that high. So 597, that's really pushing it, and that makes it very unusual for the Pacific Northwest because that's not really where we see it. Anyway, that high will be gradually dying off into early next week. And the heat will back off just a tiny bit. And then we get kind of into a weak flow pattern across much of the U.S. See that kind of a weak westerly flow? A little bit stronger in the, around the Great Lakes, but weaker elsewhere. So we're not going to see too much in the way of organized thunderstorms. Checking in on the National Hurricane Center Department. Not much going on. This little wave coming off of Africa. They're not expecting development with that. The five-day, 20% chance of formation in five days. So kind of an outlier there that may make it to the Windward Islands. So we'll just continue to monitor that. Otherwise, the tropics looking pretty quiet. A little different in Mexico. We don't often look down here, but we do have Enrique. 45 knots on that storm. And there's our track on that hurricane moving off the Mexican coast and towards Baja, California. The big story in the Pacific Northwest is the heat. There's Portland coming up to 104, Seattle 97, getting way up there. And it's worse for Sunday. 102 in Seattle, 109 at Portland, which breaks the all-time record. Monday, continued heat, maybe shifting a tiny bit to the east there. But Seattle coming in with 104, which breaks the all-time record for them. 109, Redmond, Oregon. That's another all-time record breaker. And let me give you all of the records. There you go. This is a graphic showing the all-time records 
For example, Boise, they've never been above 111. The stations that are expected to break records, according to the Weather Service, according to their official forecast, it's going to be these stations here. Seattle with 104, one degree above the all-time record. Yakima, a degree also above the record. And then Portland and Redmond. Spokane will probably tie their record. And so far... They're not seeing much potential for records to be broken out to the east. Of course, we'll revisit that next week. Possibly a lot of these cities will break their daily records, but the historic all-time records will be confined to those four stations and maybe a few that we have not marked on the chart. And a change in the southwestern U.S. Starting on Sunday, you see those precip chances start to build in from the east. By Monday, 40% chance of rain there in Tucson, 40 to 50% chance on Tuesday, more chances for Wednesday. So I think our monsoon is setting in. And check out those dew points for Monday, 51 to 55, 54 to 60 on Tuesday. and near 60 on Wednesday. And that typically does mark the start of the monsoon. And here we have the 925 millibar dew point. That's going to be about two to 3,000 feet MSL. And you can see that moisture coming in on Sunday from the east into southern Arizona. That's it surging in. The cyan colors are going to be dew points of around 60 at 925 millibars. And that's quite a fetch moving in from the east. So the deserts will bloom. And we will check back in on that next week. All right, we've got about 17 minutes and 33 seconds of program on that timeline. So we better get it wrapped up or we're going to be here all night. Hope you all have a great weekend. We'll see you next week, Monday for our supporters, and Tuesday for everybody else. And here's how to support the program. We've got a Patreon, or you can pick up some books and software at weathergraphics.com. And we'll see you next week. Have a good one. Bye-bye.